My name is Daniel Adibi, and I will be your host for Our World 101, the show in which we explain complicated, real-world events and issues to bridge people together. Today's topic is global citizenship. A global citizen is someone who is able to befriend anybody, regardless of the other person's ethnicity or culture. Here to talk to us today about global citizenship is distinguished and best-selling author Homa Tavikar. She has written several books, including the highly acclaimed Growing Up Global, which contains various activities and instructions for raising and being global citizens. So, Mrs. Tavingar, welcome to the show. We are really excited to have you here. Thanks, Daniel. I love your show. Thank you. Um, before we continue, I just wanted to mention that this episode is dedicated to Vince Chelly. He believed in me and he was a mentor to me, and this TV show would not be possible without him. Uh, so, Mrs. Tavingar, to start off, can you explain in your own words what it means to be a global citizen? Sure. Um, so I kind of came up with my own definition of global citizenship because it was a topic that I really cared about. And when I looked up how other people defined it in textbooks and in other places, I got very long answers that were a little hard to follow and a little hard to remember but I wanted it to be something that felt personal and real. So I came up with this description that uh, really goes with the way you described it at the beginning of the show. It is simply to be a friend to the whole human race. And so when we peel back the layers of what it means to be a, a friend, a good friend, we find qualities like loyalty, kindness, caring, helping others, not being judgmental, and even having fun together with your friend. And I think all of those go with the idea of being a global citizen is really the equivalent of being a friend to the whole human race, being a friend on a wider scale. Yeah, and you really um, illustrate that in your book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it and what you hope to achieve through writing it? Sure. So I wrote the book. It, it's now been over 10 years since I wrote Growing Up Global, and I have a copy. Actually, you can see it right behind my shirt, coincidentally sort of matches the yellow <laughs> copy. Of, you know, maybe I'll get it down. Um, so here's Growing Up Global, Raising Children to Be at Home in the World. And you can see something I'm really proud of was a quote from Dr. Jane Goodall. She said, it had fascinating ideas for giving young people opportunities to become truly global citizens. And she's one of my heroes. Um, but the book is basically a guide for parents for raising a global citizen. So even if you can't get on an airplane, especially like over the last 16 months, we've been, you know, no one's really been traveling you can still raise your child to be a global citizen. You can still think of yourself as connected to the world, as a friend to the whole human race. And um, so the book offers a lot of really easy ideas that you can do from right here, anytime with, you don't need a lot of money, you don't need to buy plane tickets, um, to feel like you are connected to the world, you can explore, discover, and um, and also just enjoy the world we live in, not just be afraid of it. Uh, yeah, so what inspired you to write your book? I remember um, reading about your experiences in China and West Africa. Can you expand on that? Sure. So um, before I wrote the book, I spent over 20 years as a consultant to businesses, helping them understand global markets and expand internationally and be competitive in the global marketplace. And then 9-11 happened, and that was a terrible tragedy. And one of the things that happened immediately after 9-11, 2001, way before you were born, um, immediately after the world came together, they wanted to help the victims. They wanted to find who did this. They, they were really concerned for the United States. But then there was a lot of fear and two wars began after that. And so I was concerned for my own children. I didn't want them to fear the world after 9-11. I wanted them to have an opportunity to embrace the world just as I did. And then 
as you mentioned, um, with China, I was in China for a business trip and it was on the first anniversary of 9-11. And I noticed how people there were really interested in having their children learn English and excel in their studies, not only for their own benefit. And sorry, I'm about to sneeze because my allergies are, <laughs> no, it passed. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I noticed that the parents in China were very interested in educating their children to know about the world, to learn other languages. And it was like, I came back from that trip and I asked my friends and neighbors on the main line, I live near the studio, um, and I said, uh, what are we doing to prepare our children for the world that is changing and not just fear the world? And people were like, I don't know what you're talking about. And so I set off on this sort of quest for ideas and I wanted to find solutions, but I didn't find easy ones, just like I didn't find the definition I wanted for a global citizen. So I wrote the book that I wanted to buy and that turned into Growing Up Global. Um, and in that book, I also share an experience where I had an opportunity to travel to West Africa, to the little country of the Gambia with our three daughters. Um, and um, at the time they were three, 11 and 13. Um, and um, we lived there for about four months and just kind of had the opportunity for the girls to go to school, to experience life. And I learned so much watching my own children interact in such a different place from the main line. And that's actually where I stumbled on the definition of being a friend to the whole human race. Um, so those experiences also, also showed me that even though I had the opportunity to travel to China, to West Africa, not everybody does, and you don't have to in order to widen your vision and care about the world beyond your immediate circle. And that's really amazing that you were passionate about this topic of global citizenship and you weren't able to find anything, so you created it. And uh, as you said, you wrote the book you wanted to buy. Yeah. You know, one other thing that I learned that might be interesting for your viewers in terms of even making a difference in the world is that initially when I thought about this book because it was the book I wanted to buy, I didn't feel really um, qualified to write the book. I didn't think that I had the ability but I kind of became determined to learn. And what I learned since then is I can be a lifelong learner. So I am always learning and I don't have all the answers, but there are so many people around me that do. And I think that's what you're doing with this show. I can learn from so many, gather those and then build from there. And that's a bit of what I did in writing the book. Yeah. Um, so you had a very interesting background. Um, if I remember correctly, your mother's side of the family was Orthodox Jewish and your father's side was predominantly Muslim. Uh, your family embraced the Baha'i faith, which says that humanity is one and you have family all over the world, but there is love and you are connected. Did all of that motivate you to write your book? Gosh, Daniel, that is such a beautiful uh, summary and insight. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's the quick answer. It definitely motivated me. I learned through my own family experience that just because there is a history of war between, you know, in the Middle East, the war between Jews and Muslims in, in Palestine and Israel um, and, and between so many people that it's not impossible to overcome it. And so I'm very inspired by these stories of my own family, my own grandparents who were very courageous to leave traditional views that were very divisive and embrace a perspective that didn't make, it didn't deny their heritage. It, it built from their heritage, 
we're proud of our heritage, but then it also, there's a, there's a idea in the Baha'i faith that says, let your vision be world embracing rather than confined to your own selves. And so it's like kind of an idea of yes and, like, yes, I can love the world and remember who I am and where I come from and, and that we can be peacemakers. And so, as you say, in the Baha'i faith, this idea of the oneness of humanity and the, the like spiritual and fundamental oneness of when you look at the core principles of all the world's religions, you see there's so much that they share. What if we start conversations based on what we have in common and not focused on the differences? By starting with what we have in common, we learn from each other and we learn to humanize each other. And again, like be friends. I don't have to agree with everything my friend believes or does or says, but at least we can talk about it. And that's a little bit of this approach to recognizing the oneness of humanity. Yeah, and that's um, kind of going off of global citizenship, you know, being a friend to the whole human race. Right. And, um, Iran historically has uh, been a country that is comprised of multiple faiths and religions. And in the 1970s, Jews and Baha'is were persecuted. But uh, your family is a testament that love transcends religion and background. That is beautifully put, Daniel. Absolutely. Um, what message would you like to send the world through growing up global? Hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting. Growing Up Global was published in 2009, and I was very honored. Um, it's, it was my first book. I've written books since then, um, it, and it was published by Random House, the biggest publisher in the world. They thought there was something there, um, but, you know, I, can't, I kept thinking as I was writing the book, I better hurry up and write it because people are going to figure this out, and it's not going to be a new idea anymore, and since then, all these years have passed, and I'm, I am sad to say that there's still so far to go. Like today, you know, people, there's a lot of anti-Asian racism that we see. There is a lot of anti-Black racism. There's a lot of fear of teaching honest history and teaching about um, things that are difficult. And the past, the human experience, our history is difficult. And yet, I think that when we are honest, like I think kids, people growing up want their parents to be honest with them. They don't want us to hide all the truth in under the bed and then you discover it later and you tell your parents, how come you never told me that this happened in our past. What, and I think that's one of the challenges that the world is going through right now. And so I think with um, ideas like that come from growing up global, being a friend to the whole human race, honesty and truth and truth telling and trust are really important messages. So we need to, to be better truth tellers and reach out to people more honestly. It, it's not saying that an individual is a bad person, maybe because they come from a place that has not a great history. For example, I was born in Iran. And just because, yes, the Iranian government um, has done terrible human rights violations. I have to be honest about that. That doesn't, that isn't saying. I am a horrible person and I cannot be redeemed. It's just saying that we have to be honest, this is the past, or this is even the, the current situation in some cases. So I hope that that message of sort of honesty and truth telling comes through so that we are able to become friends to the whole human race. Without that, it's it, it will be very difficult to gain trust. 
Yeah, we have to face our history, like you said. We have to face it honestly so we can shape a better future. It's so true. And, and I have to say that when I was growing up, so I grew up in the United States. I went to elementary school in Indiana. I went to high school in California. And um, we didn't learn about a lot of the, the history, things like the Tulsa race massacre that's 100 years old this year. Um, there were a lot of incidents in American history that we never learned. And now we're saying, gosh, if only we had learned that, we could have done a better job. And so now we're sort of passing this on to young people today and, and adults can't agree with the, the path that we should take. Um, but I really think, you know, one of the things about growing up global and global citizenship, the root is love. So it comes, I love people. I love humanity. I love getting to know people's stories. And so I'm not wanting to know someone's story because I want to accuse them and make them feel bad about themselves. I want to know someone's story because I'll learn about myself, because maybe it'll help me be a better person to make the world a better place. And so if we can create an environment of love and start with love, I think that it will potentially, it could really make a big difference. Yeah, we can expand our minds with love. Absolutely. Um, I know you mentioned this in your book a lot, and that's primarily what your book is about, but what can parents and kids do to expand their minds and to become a global citizen? Well, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff that you can do, like try, you know, and, and think of it as a model of friendship. So if you're going to be a friend to the whole human race, what do you do with your friend? Maybe you're going to have a meal together. So try some food that you've never had. Have you ever had Vietnamese food or Mongolian food or Iranian food or Lebanese food? Um, try or Ethiopian food. I love some Ethiopian restaurants in West Philly. Um, so you, you maybe try a new food. Maybe you watch a movie with your friend that comes from a different country or culture or language. That gives you a little bit of a lens into a different culture. Um, you're going to have conversations with your friends. So learning about what different people believe and care about. Um, maybe do you have a world map at your house or a globe? Like even just knowing a little bit of geography and knowing where um, a country is located can be really meaningful. And in fact, there's a study from the New York Times. It's one of my favorite studies because it's so simple. A few years ago, they did a survey of people um, when there was some discussion about um, a bombing North Korea. And they asked Americans, can you find North Korea on a map? And the people that could find it on a map did not favor going to war with North Korea. The people that could not find North Korea on a map said, yeah, let's bomb Korea. So it's an interesting, if we know where countries are located and where cities are located and we learn some geography, it actually helps us be peacemakers. That's simple, simple things. So there are lots of little things you can do. Um, and, and, and like, how about reading books from authors from different cultures and races and backgrounds? It doesn't have to be a book about their culture, but just them telling a story from their perspective can be very enriching. So those are, there's, there's a ton of stuff that, that can be done. Yeah, um, as you said, there are a lot of simple things to do. And I think you really do a good job of illustrating that in your book. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so right now, we are currently becoming more connected with social media, communication, and transportation. But at the same time, we're also becoming more divided with a growing fear of the other, whoever the other may be. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think it's interesting because you're right. Social media can bring us together and it can divide us. So if your only contact with someone is through social media, and sometimes people will make comments uh, like on Instagram or Facebook that, 
or YouTube that they never would have made to the person in person, you kind of have to pause and check yourself and ask, would I have said this to someone to their face? If you wouldn't, don't do it. Um, and so, you know, I think we have to, as parents in particular, talk to our kids about the way that we use social media and make sure that we have as much human contact as we can, as we do with social media. And even sometimes you might meet someone on social media, it can turn into a positive um, experience. It doesn't have to only stay sort of theoretical. Theoretical people are scary and theoretical people are the ones that are othered, but real people can be, it, it, it's very different. I actually met, I wrote another book called The Global Education Toolkit for Elementary Learners that's used by schools. I met my co-author for that book on Twitter. So we met on Twitter and then we ended up really getting along and she and I became friends and we wrote almost the entire book on a Google Drive um, format before we even met each other and uh, in real life. So, you know, I think that technology is amazing, but how do you humanize it is, is like the next question. Yeah, getting to know someone um, can eliminate that fear of the other because um, the other is kind of the unknown. But once you figure out what that person is like, you don't fear them anymore. Right. Um, many people believe that the only way to become a global citizen is through traveling, but you mentioned in your book that there are so many other ways. A lot of the fundamental values, such as empathy and kindness, are modeled from parents, but how can schools incorporate global citizenship into their curriculum? Mm -hmm. So most of my work today is focused on schools, and I, work with, I have the benefit of working with schools all over the world. And so I work with them on a lot of different topics. It, global citizenship is one of them. I also work with schools on diversity, equity, inclusion, and on innovation and learning and change. Um, so ways that schools can incorporate global citizenship. So there's a whole like model of building global competence. And global competence is really about applying your learning to real situations and making meaning and making a difference through your learning. And it's done by using source materials that aren't just your typical textbook and the authors that maybe were from my generation, but are uh, have a lot of different perspectives, including news sources from around the world. It involves recognizing perspectives that are different from your own. So like schools always teach about things like homes or water resources or families or um, environmental sustainability or even geometry or literature. All of those can have many different perspectives. People whose living circumstances are different, whose families are different, race, culture, language. Um, so trying to incorporate some of those perspectives into the lessons is important. And then the way that we even show how we've learned that you don't have to only take a test or make a poster or do a worksheet. But what if like, like the TV show like this could be an evaluation. It could be the way that shows like I can tell you read my book by the questions. So that to me is like, instead of just do a simple book report, what if you made a podcast or a TV show? What if you started a blog where you connected with kids in a school on the other side of the world? And then the final element of global competence that helps build global citizenship is taking action. So Ideally, you want to do something about your learning, especially if it helps others, because our world needs a lot of help right now. Mm -hmm. So perspective, involvement, and taking action. And that's and, how. And 
new sources of information. The way we investigate and gather information is, is the other element that's really important. And all of those will help us to become global citizens. Absolutely. Um, so why is it so important to be a global citizen? Well, I just think our world needs peace. And when you look at the environmental degradation, when you look at even coronavirus, the vaccine, uh, for example, the vaccine development, it didn't just happen by a person working alone in a lab in one country. It was thanks to cooperation across many countries, including immigrants who were like in Germany, they were immigrants that developed it. In the United States, the lead researcher was a young black woman. Um, and all of these scientists around the world helped each other. And if we can learn how to do that on many other levels, it's going to be so useful. And I want to share, there's, there's a um, point that I always make with students that, especially parents and teachers, we need to shift the question when we ask our students, don't ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? But ask your student, what problem do you want to solve? And so when you are focused on the problem that you want to solve, even from a young age, you start to see yourself as taking a role in the world. So I think that might be able to help. Yeah, and unification will help us um, to tackle some of our real world problems right now. Absolutely. So I remember that you said that you lived in America during the Iran hostage crisis. Mm -hmm. My parents also did, and they have vivid memories of encountering racism towards Iranians. How did you face the backlash against the Iranians back then? Yeah, well, I was in middle school and, um, you know, I think that for me, what was important is that I had friends that really knew me and they knew that I had nothing to do with that situation. And so that's an example of when you humanize and you get to know a person as an individual, it makes a difference. So I sort of focused on the positive people and then all, a lot of negative people, I tried to just... Um, not pay as much attention to, but it wasn't it wasn't easy. And it's something that I constantly feel now looking back, I some ways I feel lucky because it allows me to have more empathy for people who are also in difficult situations. Yeah, and your friends were acting like global citizens because they yes. were befriending you even with all of the escalating political situations of that time. And that just exactly. reflects on the importance of global citizenship. That's exactly right. Yeah, you brought it full circle, Daniel. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we've had a great discussion. We talked about your book, Growing Up Global, what it means to be a real global citizen, your upbringing and its impact on you, some tips for being a global citizen, and the importance of global citizenship. Again, Mrs. Tavingar, thank you so much for being on the show. It was an amazing experience talking to you, and I feel like I, I really learned a lot. Thank you, Daniel. I love what you're doing and just keep learning and growing and talking to lots of people. It's fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. To all of our viewers, I hope you'll join us for our next episode. I'm Daniel Odibi, and I'll see you soon.